Today we're here with the president of ASB, Professor Charles Fine, uh, the dean of Asia School of Business, Professor at MIT Sloan, and very, very much one of the inspirations and drivers of this project. And today we're going to talk about cognitive readiness. Charlie, hi, how are you? Good. Thank you, Laura Donna. It's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this project. And I'm cognitively ready for this interview. So exciting. So let's let's get right into it. So can you describe or can you define what do you think cognitive readiness is using your own words? Can you define it? So I think in life and in work, unexpected things happen. Mm -hmm. And different people can be have different levels of readiness. Are you ready for what might happen? Yeah. I mean, most people, if the world is stable and things aren't changing, you go into work each day or you go into life each day and you don't expect anything new. But that doesn't happen yeah. in the real world. There's always change, there's always disruption. And cognitive readiness is the ability to deal intellectually, conceptually, and emotionally with whatever might come. So organizations can be more or less cognitive ready, individuals can be more or less cognitively ready. And uh, we try to emphasize at ASB the need and the importance of being cognitively ready. So speaking of organizations being cognitive ready, you are a leader, you're a CEO, you're a dean, you're a president. I think a lot of your job requires you to be cognitive ready. I also think of you as somebody who has a very high degree of cognitive readiness. I think of you as, as a master of this skill. Uh, I know, it's the president, we have to say these things. <laughs> but seriously now, what do you think helped you achieve a higher level of cognitive readiness? How can one develop this skill? So there's maybe a positive side and a negative side. Mm -hmm. The positive side is learning to do what, you, what one might call systems thinking, mm. which comes from the, the, the field of system dynamics at MIT, which is about uh, understanding complex environments mm -hmm. and the forces that might impact them. The positive side is to learn to be cognitively ready by understanding systems and the dynamics of those systems. Yeah. The more negative side is what you might say is about paranoia. Yeah. That the more paranoid someone is, the more, in some sense, they're worrying about mm -hmm. what might happen. And if you worry about things that might happen, you can turn that into cognitively ready. Well, what if this thing happens? How would I react? What if this thing happens? How would I react? So, so if you worry about all the things that could happen, Pandemics might show up, mm. tornadoes, alligators, who knows what, right? How, how are you going to be ready for that? And if, you, if you're a little paranoid about those kinds of things, you think about it, makes you more cognitively ready, more ready mm. to address whatever comes down, uh, whatever happens. Uh, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned system dynamics, um, and system dynamics is actually a sharp skill at ASB. I don't think a lot of people are familiar with what uh, system dynamics is and how do we use it and and I love the the relationship between the smart skill of cognitive readiness and the sharp skills of of system dynamics. What is system dynamics and how does one use it? So formally system dynamics is a, an approach toward modeling uh, different uh, aspects of an environment and a system, of a system. A system mm -hmm. can include people, it can include uh, technology, it can include economic forces, it can include uh, organizations, and how those pieces interact yeah. and how they evolve over time. So the dynamics part, if you take a snapshot in time of some com complex system, you're, you don't have a dynamic story. The, the system dynamics is trying to understand how that complex environment is going to change over time, how mm -hmm. it might evolve over time. And so that helps you think about the scenarios for which you need to be mm -hmm. cognitively ready. So it could evolve this way, it could evolve that way. So system dynamics is a formal discipline for representing, modeling, uh, different possible futures of mm -hmm. how systems might evolve. And the relationships between how, between each element and how each element impacts another element. Yeah, the interrelationships in the system are, are key. If I think about uh, the past almost two years now of, of the pandemic, and I think about how 2020 and how 2021 impacted the world, and if I also think about a Asia School of Business and your leadership, you are one of the very few people who was extremely paranoid all the way back in January, which is apparently, 
you know, re- a prerequisite for cognitive readiness. But you, you were very, very paranoid right away about what's going to happen. And then you started to predict things in almost a, an eerie way because they, they, they happened. And when I asked you back, back in the day, I was like, how can you see these things? You were like, you were saying, well, it's very much a system dynamics mindset. Can you think a little bit about the last two years and how, how, uh, how being cognitively ready helped you? in a way, anticipate what to do, how to prepare for what the pandemic is going to bring. And obviously, we couldn't prepare for everything, but I do think that ASB was probably a little bit more prepared than some of organizations. So I think there's a personal level to this question and an organizational yeah. level. On the personal, let me think, speak to the organizational level first. On the organizational level, as you know, for the last four or five years, every year, we've done an or- a reorganization of some sort yeah. at ASB. And people often are de- uncomfortable with reorganizations. <laughs> we, oh, my job's going to change. What's going to happen? There's uncertainty. How am I going to deal with it? And my feeling is, if you do that every year, eventually people don't worry about it so mm-hmm. much. And, they, and it becomes a normal part of life that things are going to change. And so over time, I think the organization became more cognitively ready for change. This is before the pandemic even started because we were in the habit of enforcing and creating change Mm -hmm. on a regular basis anyways. So I think that helped the organization. On a personal level, I certainly didn't anticipate the pandemic prior to uh, January of 2020. But in the the early, when the very earliest uh, information started coming out of China, about the uh, coronavirus, I did begin projecting and speculating how that might flow mm-hmm. and and uh, how it might uh, roll out over Asia, roll out over the world. And so very early on, ASB began to take it seriously. As you know, we, we made some just choices in January of 2020 to change our action learning plans yeah. and prepare. They were not people. very popular, those choices. And right. remember, a lot of people fought us very hard over these choices. Yeah, not everyone thought that the pandemic was going to be a big deal. Yeah. And we did some things that some people weren't happy with by canceling travel and, mm-hmm. and uh, bringing canceling people projects, back. bringing people back from uh, their projects. Uh, that turned out to be the right thing to do. Maybe that was a little bit of the paranoia Mm -hmm. that the worst case was we didn't want our students to be stranded uh, in places when they couldn't get back or be exposed to higher risk of getting this unknown virus at the time. I was thinking about what you said, that if uh, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready, right? (laughs) So cognitive readiness, in a way, is a constant state of readiness. So I think so. Uh, And... uh, if you think about competitive athletes in team sports, for example, they're ready when they're on the playing field or on the playing court. They're sort of ready all the time. Yeah. And lots of things can can evolve in, in a playing field or a playing court. And so it's the same thing in organizations. Uh, it may not feel as dynamic minute to minute as a basketball game or a mm. soccer game or something like that. But there's always dynamics going on. And if, quote unquote, the players are ready, then wherever the ball comes, you're you're ready to play the ball. Mm-hmm. Well, I sure do feel like ASB is a constant stage of Olympics. <laughs> We're always trying to find the ball. <laughs> well, so I do think uh, we have been in startup mode for the past few years, and we yeah. transitioned from startup mode to pandemic mode. Yeah. So we haven't known anything that feels like steady state as an organization. Uh, that may not be what life will be like mm-hmm. forever, but as you know, I always remind people that Jeff Bezos at Amazon says it's always day one at Amazon. It's yeah. always the first day of our new startup. We need to think that way, and when we stop thinking that way, we're going to decline. So I, so I do think a permanent state of cognitive readiness is not a bad thing mm-hmm. for an organization. Yeah. I wonder if Jeff Bezos is going to say it's always day one on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I don't know. <laughs> so let me let me bring you back to to the title of this book. Sure. You know that this is one of my favorite expressions. The job is easy. The people are not. Before you became a CEO, you had the luxury of being only a professor, <laughs> where you teach management. Thinking a little bit about the difference between being a professor of management, being a practitioner of management, and comparing a little bit your last six years 
to the previous, you know, 20, 30 years of teaching management, what did you learn about managing people? Yeah. So I would say, if I go all the way back to my academic training, it was technical, it was mm -hmm. mathematical, and it didn't represent people in a three-dimensional way, mm -hmm. right? There that, was a lot of sharp skills, right, in your background. Yeah, there was a lot of sharp skills, and there was just a, I would say I had an underappreciation of the complexities of or, or, organizational dynamics with human beings in them, yeah. right? <laughs> and when you say the job is easy, the people are not, uh, I think the, 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 if you will, the system dynamics of a system with people in it is very much more complex than a system dynamics of people with just, of, of a system with just things in it. Because mm -hmm. the things don't think, they just yeah. are, can be manipulated, if you will. But once you add people to the equation, you get a whole other dimension of complexity, uncertainty, uh, motivations. Uh, uh, the seven deadly sins of uh, mm -hmm. on and on and on. So, so people are complex, and organizations, given that they're populated with people, yeah. uh, experience those complexities. I remember the day I realized that organizations are made of people. It completely <laughs> changed my way of understanding management. And I know it's such an obvious observation, but unless you think intentfully that actually organizations are not, you know, cerebral entities, but they are made of people and people are made of flaws and the job is easy, the people are not. So you're also very much my, my partner in crime when it came to the definition of smart and sharp skills. So uh, if you remember almost 2016, 15, I started saying that I don't want to call soft skills soft anymore because there's nothing soft about them. And you're actually the, the, the creator of the sharp skills because you said, well, analogous to that, Hard skills are not hard, they are sharp. We have been practicing smart skills actively for the past three, four years at ASB. If you think about the top 10 smart skills that we practice at ASB, besides cognitive readiness, was there a smart skill that sort of took you by surprise once you realized what it is and did you become a lot more aware about it? So I think until I started at ASB, I never really thought about the role of humility in an organization mm -hmm. and the importance of uh, approaching challenges with humility. That, that when I, f I find that if someone approaches a challenge or an organization or a situation with arrogance, and I think of arrogance as sort of the opposite yeah. of humility, uh, it shuts people down. It turns people off. Uh, whereas if you approach others with a, a sense of humility, with a, if you project humility, uh, which project humility is almost a contradiction in terms <laughs> because humility is something that's kind of in the background, but uh, it makes others more open to mm. share, makes them feel like it's a safe environment to express ideas and ideas flow better. Uh, arrogance shuts down others in terms of mm. sharing their ideas, uh, taking personal risk, if you will. So I think humility is one of the smart skills that I I value a lot in terms of uh, Im influencing the, the ability of an organization to function well. And, and speaking of speaking of the smart skills, you're also responsible for hiring a lot of people, or at least recruiting and selecting a lot of people, and then working with a lot of them. Um, there's a, I think, I believe it's a misconception that one cannot assess smart skills. Can you assess smart skills in your organization when you hire, when you when you train, when you work with people? And if so, how? Yeah. So I think when you're hiring people, it can be challenging mm -hmm. to to uh, to measure their smart skills. Yeah. Partly because people are on their best behavior, uh, they they perceive that they need to project a certain image. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas once they're involved in the organization. Uh, their true self might come out more, right? That, that people are on their best behavior when they yeah. interview. Um, that said, it's kind of well known that some some people say the best way to test someone for a job interview is not in a job interview, but you take them to dinner, you take them mm -hmm. to a social event, and you see how they interact. You try to see their more natural self, yeah. their more true self. I think you can measure that to some or assess that. I don't know if you can mm -hmm. measure it Or at it least clearly. observe. Yeah. You can observe. Uh, but within that, but there's a huge spectrum of 
of normal, if you will, right? So some people are naturally introverts, some people are naturally extroverts. You can be high in smart skills and be an extrovert, and you can be high in smart skills and be an introvert, but you see very different behaviors mm -hmm. between an extrovert and an introvert. Yeah. And so How about it when takes you work with time. people? How do you assess somebody's smart skills when you work with somebody? One thing I try to look for is self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Are people aware of how they're being perceived by me, being perceived by others? Someone who has low self-awareness, I think of that as an indicator of potentially at risk for not having good mm -hmm. smart skills. You, you were talking about humility. Can you, can you, test, can you see humility in action? We can, can you can recognize it when you see arrogance, yes. right? <laughs> and and uh, humility, I mean, it comes out in a more complex environment. So, mm -hmm. how much credit someone tries to take versus sharing yeah. credit, how much someone uh, uh, engages a team versus trying to dominate a team, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, you, could, you can see it in action. Uh, you know, the famous quote about, I can't define obscenity, but I know it when I see yeah. it, right? <laughs> so maybe I, uh, I need to work harder on mm -hmm. figuring out how to define humility rather than just know it when you see it. Well, we have a chapter on humility, so you can read more about it. <laughs> um, let's, let's talk a little bit about our students. So one of our goals here at Asia School of Business is to develop principal and transformative leaders. But we also want our leaders to be smart and sharp. And one of the ways of, of teaching smart skills is by throwing them in action, which is something that you very much believe in. You're the mm -hmm. architect of designing the most action-packed MBA program in the world. What is your aspiration when it comes to the action learning program and the relationship to developing smart skills for yeah. our students? Yeah. So I think, um, first of all, action learning is about putting theory into practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can read a book about uh, how to kick a soccer ball, but until you get out on the field and kick yeah. it, you, have you really learned anything about how to kick a, kick a soccer ball? So the same thing's true in management. The same thing's true in smart skills. That you can you can read the theory of uh, cognitive readiness. You can read the theory of humility. You can read the theory of these other things. But until you go out into an organization and you're in the complexity of the environment with lots of other people and lots of challenges, then that's when you begin to have, you're, you're, you're practicing your smart skills on the playing field, mm -hmm. if you will. And that's when you can begin to refine them, but you refine them partly by practice and partly by reflection. Yeah. So you're in a situation, it's, it's a real time problem, uh, solving team environment perhaps, lots of things are going on. Uh, you may not be thinking about, well, which smart skills am I using now or whatever. <laughs> but afterwards, if you ha can have a reflection session, you can think about, well, what happened in that conversation? What mm -hmm. happened in that meeting? What did I do? What did I say? What did others do? What did others say? And how can I re reflect and interpret my own behaviors? And can I see where I was stronger or weaker in different skills? And that the, that awareness begins helps you begin to think about how do I strengthen the skills and, and coaching helps with that as well but the action part is critical you can't just learn smart skills by reading the theory mm -hmm. of smart skills you have to get out there and try it yeah and i think that's that's why we have at least the most recent initiative that we have we we teach the students the theory of smart skills right so we teach about all this we teach about humility and cognitive readiness and validation and managing up and then we ask them to go in action and be very much self-aware of practicing and observing it on others. And then we ask them to come back and reflect both individually and then collectively as a group. We also coach them because that was one of the one of the initiatives that we have developed together. So we bring a bunch of coaches, uh, both psychological support, but also managerial support, and then we send them back. So I think when I hear, especially colleagues from our field, that, that say you can't really teach smart skills or soft skills the way they refer to them, I have to say you can. It takes a lot more effort and it takes a lot of, of, of a repetitive cycle because you can have a, an inkling of emotional maturity, but this doesn't mean that you can, cannot expand it in time, right? I completely agree with you. We're on the same page. Uh, that the learning happens through practice and repetition mm -hmm. and self-observation, others' observation, 
coaching, all those pieces have to come together for someone to grow, particularly in something as complex as emotional maturity. Yeah. Uh, some of some aspects of emotional maturity, I think, are uh, planted at an early age. Absolutely. And yeah. there are some people who are just going to rise to a higher level of emotional maturity than others. Mm -hmm. uh, but everybody can grow to some degree and it's desirable to grow in emotional maturity. You want to be, a, you want to have people in your organization who have a mature view, who can keep their emotions in check uh, when needed uh, and respond to others in appropriate ways. Yeah, when I when I thought about the, the the top ten smart skills, and I remember you and I had a conversation, and you say maybe it's it's more important the sum than the individual. And when I when I came up with the top ten smart skills, I actually it's not, I don't think that I had a very very rigorous approach about it. But what I did, I observed very very attentively what our colleagues do, what our students do, what do our students need to succeed in, in their projects, and these are sort of like the. The, the, the skills that sort of rose to the top. And I'm sure there's a lot more that we can talk about. Self-awareness is an amazing smart skill as well. But I also wanted to bring some skills that we actually don't talk that much about. For example, followership. And, and I'm gonna ask you pr probably a little bit more about other skills because you know, like I said, the, the two of us have also been very much involved in this in this project. But have you thought about followership as a smart skill before we, we started practicing? And how do you see this type of skill fitting into actually a, a leadership narrative of an organization. Yeah. So I, I hadn't thought about fellowship very much before ASB and uh, partly perhaps because as a professor, I worked mostly as an individual, mm -hmm. not as a member of teams, not with any kind of a hierarchy. The, yeah. the academic environment for professors at MIT is very flat organizationally and everybody does their Every, the way I characterize MIT is there are a thousand professors and each one is yeah. his or her own entrepreneur. Yeah. So you don't have hierarchical organizations. But obviously at ASB, there are some people who are leaders and there are some people who are expected to follow or need to figure out how to follow. That, that uh, an organization has initiatives, it has strategies, it has directions it needs to go in. And at some point, people have to get behind the... The leader, the mm -hmm. leadership, the 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 uh, the plans, yeah. and follow, uh, and you want people to follow not like mindless sheep, but like uh, thoughtful, uh, reflective practitioners. So you want, uh, I'm following. I understand where we're trying to go, but I'm thinking about how to be pr how to be productively p yeah. be a part of that, and how to improve the path as we go along. So I think fellowship can, uh, when practiced well, is a is a very active skill. It's Absolutely. not a it's not a passive skill, if you will. And I actually think when I became aware of followership, I I, I never thought of it as a um, as a the, the simple skill of following a leader, but I thought more of it as the the sophisticated skill of following a purpose and a mission and a set of values. And I think you, as a CEO, you actually do a lot of followership. Um, you have to follow the mission of the school more than anything. Um, you also have a boss because everybody, everybody, every boss has a boss, right? Uh, you have a board. You have a group of constituents that you have to to serve and support. Um, my my final question to you will be: If you think a little bit about the, the the overall set of smart skills, even going beyond the top ten that we have here. What are your aspirations when it comes to smart skills? But also you can talk about Sharp if you want. What are your aspirations for you as a leader, but also for your organization and for, for our students? So that's a, that's a big question. Yes, well, for a big man. <laughs> you are the president after all. So what do you aspire yeah. in terms of smart skills for yourself and for, for your group? I aspire for the people of ASB, myself included, to be able to grow and fulfill their fullest potential. Mm -hmm. And as you know, I've many times said in our town halls and to our people in our organization, I hope that when you retire and you're a grandparent or great grandparent rocking on your rocking chair, you'll look back and you'll say, the best years of my life were the years I spent at ASB. That was the pinnacle of my career. It was the most exciting. I grew the most, I learned the most, most rewarding. And where does that reward come from? It comes from developing mm -hmm. to feeling like I'm becoming a, 
a more capable person, having a richer set of skills, a richer set of experiences. So my aspiration, and, and I think the, the smart skills as well as the sharp skills sort of define a path for that aspiration. Mm -hmm. how, how, do, how can one measure, am I growing? Am I, am I becoming enriched? One can look at, I think you can look at that set of skills, the top 10 sharp and the top, top 10 smart, and say, I can see that I've grown. I can measure yeah. that I'm, uh, I'm enriched. And I, that's my aspiration for our faculty, our staff, our students, our corporate partners, all of our stakeholders, that they feel enriched by the existence and their interaction with this organization of ASB. I hope I don't have to become a great grandmother to say, you know, ASB <laughs> was the best job I ever have. I hope I can retire rich and famous, uh, you know, after this book becoming a bestseller. So people go and buy the book, okay? Um, this is this is a fascinating conversation. I can't wait to start talking to you about the sharp skills, which are also a very fascinating subject. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the extremely cognitive ready president of Asia School of Business, Charlie Fine. Um, the... Uh, if you want the uh, the reason why so many of us are here at Asia School of Business, the reason why so many of us follow the mission and vision of this uh, amazing institution, I will see you next time with another episode of Top 10 Smart Skills. The job is easy. The people are not, but we're going to make people better, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Laura Donna. It was a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Thank you, everybody.